happy lunching. I, there's such a good like buzz in here. Hope you're all enjoying yourselves and the breeze of the fan. You all look like models and superstars with your hair blowing in the wind. And my name is Deb Kudetsky. I'm with She Media, and I part of my job in audience development is to help educate our bloggers and the members of our partner network on tactics to help reach and grow your audience. And one of those amazing tactics is search engine optimization. So that is what this lunch session is all about. And I'm thrilled to bring up some blogger veterans, a father-daughter expert duo in the SEO space. Stefan and Chloe Spencer have been working together for a long time. They may have known each other for you know, Chloe's <laughs> entire life. Um, and they're here to help give you some best practices, help you understand what to watch for. They're going to have some slides on the screens to pay attention to. Um, so hopefully this is a great learning moment for you. Don't worry about crinkling your bags. Like, it's fine. It's not a precious space. And um, the one thing I will ask you to do when you get a second to balance those boxes is grab your business cards because I'm going to come around and collect anybody who wants to give them up to Stefan and Chloe to do a private blog evaluation for SEO. They're going to they're gonna pull some names from that toward the end of the session. So that's your prep talk. You guys ready? All right, let's yep. do this. Come on up. Yep. Little applause. Little applause. <laughs> All right, good afternoon, everyone. Hey, guys. How are you feeling? How's everybody? Good. I know you're all eating lunch, but definitely pay attention to this session. It's going to be a very tactical, hands-on session. You may want to take notes, so have your phone on the ready as well, because we're going to power through this here. And there's a lot to learn. All right, we're not going to be able to get through everybody's blog, but we're going to try and pull up some blogs and give you some real-time feedback on your SEO. And uh, so if you get your business card out, if you pass it to the side. And some of you also will get a free book. Uh, I brought not very many physical copies of my books, but I have a free digital copy uh, for everybody of Google Power Search. Let's move on to the next slide. Oh, one back. All right, so this is it's Chloe. Singing. I'm going to have to operate the and, slide. Um, I just want to, as a proud dad, say a few things about her. So if you go to the next slide, I'm hearing one. This is where Chloe got her start with uh, the Ultimate Neopets Cheat Site. Back when she was 14 years old, she was a fan about Neopets, and then she uh, saw that I was making money with uh, some passive income generating ads and sites. Do you want to yep. say a few words about Absolutely. that? Absolutely. Um, I was really inspired by my father when I was 14. And I was a huge fan of a website called Neopets. I don't know if any of you used to play on that when you were young, but it's a virtual pet site. I was obsessed with it when I was a kid. So I created a fan site, a WordPress blog. I got it to the top of Google. It became the most popular Neopets fan site on the internet. I monetized it with Google AdSense ads when I was 14. And at 15, I was generating thousands of dollars a month passive income. And at 16, I started speaking professionally about it. And at 19, I launched my SEO agency. And I help clients around the world to increase their traffic, their rankings, their sales, and um, their online presence. And I also do Facebook and Instagram advertising as well. So yeah, I've come a long way. It's been 14 years already in this industry, even though I'm 28. And uh, yeah, I love it. I love it. And this is also my fourth time speaking at Blogger. My first time was when I was 16. So always happy to be back. Let's get the elephant out of the room here. You're wondering how old am I? <laughs> <laughs> I was not 12 when I had her. I was 20, uh, and uh, now I'm 49. <laughs> I have good genes. All right, so then, uh, next slide. She started getting all these TV appearances and getting featured in newspapers and so forth. She was uh, a Huffington Post blogger at 17, so uh, in the blogging community for a very long time. Let's go to the next slide. You can see she's covered on, uh, on CNET. And next slide. So these are my three books, and I'm going to give everybody a free copy of this one, digital copy. So uh, if you just text 33444 with the keyword blog her SEO, doesn't matter if it's lowercase, uppercase, any of that, just all one word. So 33444 is the short code, and then Log her SEO. 
for those of you who want a really big book, here's uh, The Art of SEO. This is uh, third edition. Who would actually read this if I gave that to them? Like, who, who come up and get it? There you go. Enjoy it. Who really doesn't like reading digitally and they want to read off of? Okay, come and get it. <laughs> like, you gotta come fast. <laughs> okay, and then, just so I'm not pigeonholed as an SEO guy, I uh, co-authored a book about social media and online sales. So who wants social e-commerce? Yeah? All right. Okay, but everybody gets a copy of digital of the uh, digital edition of uh, Google Power Search. All right. Next, here's what we're going to cover in this short 30-minute session. The biggest SEO mistakes that bloggers make, SEO tips and tricks, SEO tools, and we'll try and get some blog critiques in as well in that time slot. How are you going to see what? I don't know. I was just thinking about this. I'm wondering uh, if we should pull up the slides on the phone here so we can both sit and then we can just go through it that way. I'll start with tag pages because tag pages are the devil. Uh, who has tag pages on the blog? Who knows what tag pages are? Okay, so we're going to have to go over that. <laughs> Why don't you explain that much? <laughs> okay, so when you have a blog and you're writing a blog post and there's that spot where you can put in tags and you're just kind of putting in all these different keywords and you don't really know what they're doing or why, um, those then are going to be tag pages. So those pages that are all uh, tagged with that specific keyword, um, now they're all just going to be in this list and that doesn't do anything for you. Category pages on the other hand, are great for SEO, the tag pages are worthless. In fact, you should know index them and not even use them. You should remove them and never use them again. So, now can you hear me? Okay, now I'm back. So the way to check if you have tag pages indexed in Google is just type in site colon and then your domain name. No space after the colon, so you're going to Google for site colon and then blogger.com or whatever your domain is. Then you're going to look for tag pages in the results. If you want to get really fancy, then you could add also to the um, search query in Earl colon tag. But I don't want to overly um, you know, complicate things. So that's how you're going to see if you have tag pages indexed. And then you're going to go into your Yoast SEO settings and hit the, the little checkbox that says to no index those. Next. We've got date-based archives. Date-based archives, I don't like. I don't think users are ever interested in going to, let's say, May of 2018. That's not really that useful. Yeah, it's unnecessary to use those. And it's not great anchor text for the search engines to associate with the pages that you're linking to. They're not gonna rank, in other words, not well, unless you're trying to optimize for May 2018, which I guess is probably not. So those are not great. So sucky title tags. Title tags. Who here knows what a title tag is? Okay, <laughs> so a title tag. So the title attribute in the heads X and the HTML, if that's too geek for you, it's basically the snippet of wording that's at the top of your browser window, or if you have multiple tabs open, it's the title of each tab. That is your title tag for that page. Every page has one. You can set this with the Yoast SEO plugin other ways as well. Um, but that's the easiest way um, to, to set your title tags. Now, title tags are one of the primary spots for your keywords on each page. So it should be a title, and you don't want to make it long. You don't want to keyword stuff. It should be a good title, but it should have your primary keywords for that page in your title tag, always. And at the beginning of your title tag, Googlebot gives more weight to the, the keywords at the beginning of your title tag versus the end of them. And there's more best practices on this and you just Google it because we can't go through all of that um, in this session. Or we can jump on a call and I'll pull up your site after this session and uh, we'll go through and, and I'll walk you through how to do that. 
But so your title tag is super, super important, and your meta descriptions are going to be a little different. Google is not looking at the keywords in your meta descriptions, okay? Meta descriptions are purely for your users. So when you Google something and the 10 results, your organic results come up, the title tag that you set for your page is the title of that listing in Google, then the meta description will usually show up as a description. So you want to write your meta description so they're compelling. So they're going to generate click-through rate, CTR, right? So you're writing them for your users, but your title tags are writing for users and for Googlebot, okay? So that, by the way, is a great kind of trick question. To insert into an interview of if you're trying to hire an SEO, tell them, uh, we'll just ask them the question, what do meta descriptions do for my rankings? Right, that's a leading question. The only right answer is it doesn't improve your rankings at all. Yep. It's not a ranking signal. Meta descriptions aren't a ranking signal. Next we got uh, duplicate content. So I'll, I'll take this and just explain that every time that you have a repetition of a blog post with a little blurb or the entire post, let's say on the home page you've got 10 posts, and let's say it's the first two paragraphs, that's duplicate content that will also appear on the category pages that you've associated with uh, you know, the, the categories that you've put those blog posts in. It will also appear in date-based archives. The same text will also appear on the permalink page for the blog post. So there's a lot of duplicate content just by the nature of having a blog. My recommendation is to use optional excerpts, which is a built-in feature in WordPress, <coughs> and then you'll use those optional excerpts on every page except for the permalink blog post page. So that's unique content from all the other places where you're going to feature the blog post. So no intro, having no intro copy, that's another mistake. Do you want to? You can take it. Go ahead. OK. We want to power through, so. So sticky posts, anyone know what sticky posts are? Yeah. So it gets the post to get to the B at the top. And if you do this for category pages, then that copy will be uh, a great keyword rich introduction copy to that category. Anyone do that currently? Yeah? Awesome. Great. Using someone else's domain. Sure. So <coughs> there's a difference between WordPress.com and WordPress.org. And I found this out the hard way when I was first starting my blog at 14. It was a WordPress.com blog. So it was, you know, Neopets, I think it was Neopets Fanatic wordpress.com, right, so, or a blog spot or whatever it might be. This is a big mistake. You don't want to be on someone else's domain. Have your own. Have your own and have it hosted on a host like HostGator, Bluehost, you know, GoDaddy, whatever, that, you know, whichever one you want to use and make sure you have your own domain. Yeah. Even if uh, anyone using medium.com? Okay. Yeah. Even medium.com, you don't want to have your posts living on that domain, you want it living on your site. Next we've got um, lousy URLs. You want to take that one? Yep. So the URLs of all of your pages, you don't want them to be super long with all these weird words and numbers, short and sweet. That is the trick, okay? So when you're writing a new page, you can edit what's called the slug, and it's also called the path. Um, it's basically just the, the words that come after your domain. So example.com slash, and then that's what we call the path. And so you need to edit that down and make sure that if you're writing a blog post that has a really long title, that you cut that down inside the, the path when you're writing your blog post. And um, just use good keywords, make it short and sweet. Um, and if you're going to be going back and changing those URLs right now because you, you, you know, are going to say, well, okay, I'm going to go look through my blog post. Oh, yeah, these URLs are terrible. They're super long. Um, we'll automatically do a 301 redirect so then that doesn't render a 404 uh, page error because then it's like a not found error and your page doesn't exist anymore. So you don't want that. Um, if that were to happen, you would want to do a 301 redirect and there's a plugin for that um, called Redirection. Yep. So but you can use that. It's, but it's already automatic. built in to WordPress that when you change the post slug, it will automatically redirect from the old URL to the new one. So yeah. for po changing the post slug, you don't have to worry about the redirection plug. Yes. And then not building up your EAT, which stands for expertise, authoritativeness, and trustworthiness. <coughs> Who's heard of this 
acronym before. Yep, so yeah, a number of you. This is a uh, acronym that came out of Google. They're, they were using it uh, to describe credibility, essentially, of websites, blogs that uh, have expertise, authoritativeness, and trustworthiness because the human reviewers that they employed, they, they have an army of them, like thousands of these folks, and they look at websites such as yours and then they determine whether that is you know, a credible source or not. So if you don't have EAT, then you don't show your credentials or diplomas or certifications. You don't have authoritative links pointing to your site. You don't have trusted links to your site. And it doesn't look good. And then Google will treat you accordingly, which is not what you want. So you need EAT. I have an article in Search Engine Land called, there's, um, uh, there's no, uh, oh shoot, I'll have to pull it up. <laughs> Something about, a th a th there's no such thing. Something as, about EAT. Yeah, I'll pull it up. I can't remember the exact title of it. All right, so what do we optimize? So target keywords. Yep, so basically I wanna back up a little bit. Um, a lot of people here probably don't know really the pillars or the main foundational parts of SEO. So we can really break it down into on-page SEO, off-page SEO, and your technical SEO. So when we're looking at on-page, that includes your content, how high quality your content is, um, and the keywords that you're targeting on your pages. And then your off-page is really who's linking to you, what we call your link profile, your inbound links. Okay, so that's actually really the biggest piece of the puzzle here. Well, they all kind of go hand in hand. It's like the three-legged stool. If one of them isn't there, then it will fall. So you need all of them. There's all these pieces of the puzzle. But that's the most important one. And then there's your technical SEOs, your page speed, um, and you know, looking at your mobile friendliness and your errors and, and all that kind of good stuff. So back to your on page. So the way that you should be targeting keywords, there are so many myths that just won't die about keyword targeting. A lot of bloggers think keyword density is a thing that they need to be uh, paying attention to. How many times your keyword is on your page. It's not about that. It's about where and what keywords that you're targeting. Okay, so there's only a few spots for your keywords. Your title tag, your H1 heading, and then the first sentence or two of your body copy, those are really the most important spots for your primary keywords. They don't need to be repeated again as is elsewhere throughout your page. <coughs> um, so that's really the most important thing when yeah. it comes to keyword targeting. So it's not about repetition, as Chloe says, you do want to think about what are some related keywords. For example, if you're writing a blog post about lawnmowers and you never mention uh, grass or yards or lawns or weed whackers or landscaping or any of these other kinds of keywords, that looks very surface level. So those are called LSI keywords. They're related keywords and that makes your content look deep and not shallow. We don't want to have thin content that's thin because it's just too short. We don't want to have thin content that's just repetition of the same keyword over and over again. And we don't have, want to have content that is surface level in that it doesn't really go deep into the topic. Okay, title tags, categories, and URLs. Those are next. You want to go? Yeah. Well, we kind of already went over title tags and, and URLs and everything, so. Okay. So. Category pages, I want to just say that these are really uh, a missed opportunity for many blogs because they are targeting a certain powerful keyword oftentimes. If they're not, you might want to change your categorization. And they're linked to from every page of your site, right? They're usually part of your main nav, your top navigation. They're in your footer. So you want to take advantage of all that internal link equity and make good use of those category pages. And remember, one of the things you can do to make those category pages sing to the search engines for the keywords that you're targeting is to have intro copy using a sticky post. Um, navigation. So that includes related posts and breadcrumbs. Go ahead. Okay. So breadcrumbs, anyone use a breadcrumb nav uh, type of plugin for WordPress? No? You might want to consider that. So just a couple of you. 
because that reinforces the internal linking structure. And then related plus uh, posts. Anyone use like YARP, yet another related post plugin or anything like that? Yeah. So that gives you additional internal links to your important stuff that is related to the posts that the uh, search engine is uh, indexing. Next we have the RSS feed. So um, it's a really simple thing on that. If you have left that setting, uh, just another WordPress blog, you ever see that when you start a new WordPress blog? If you just leave that alone because it's not displayed on your website, guess what? It's still displayed in your RSS feed. And that could end up being the description of your blog on various websites that are pulling data from your RSS feed. So fix that. Uh, body copy, there's one other thing I'll say about that. Try to internally link to other uh, pages of your site. You know, like the New York Times links to their topic pages from relevant articles in the body copy of the articles. That's why they rank num like number four in Google for Iraq is because they have so many articles about Iraq that link back in the copy to the Iraq topic page. Anything else you want to say about body copy? No, that's pretty good. All right. I want to I want to get through. I okay. Get too deep into the technical stuff because some of it is just really geeky. <laughs> and it's like, woo. <laughs> so. Yeah, so there's another slide we're going to uh, pass here because it's pretty technical. Robots.txt, XML sitemaps, and so forth. <coughs> and uh, titles and headlines. <coughs> so <coughs> why lead with a number? So basically, when you're thinking of titles for your page, and so your H1 title of your page or post versus your title tag, those can be different, and they should be different. Um, but when we're talking about lead with a number, so like um, five ways to do whatever, right? Five myths to this, or the 10 best blah, 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 right? So these kind of number-based titles do really well in Google. So you should take advantage of that. So that's why we want to lead with a number for a lot of these different pages um, where, where that's ap applicable, so. Yeah, don't just take our word for it. There's actually hardcore research that was done to find out what reader preferences were for different types of headlines. And number-based headlines, according to this conductor study, um, which is written up on Moz.com, five reader headlines that uh, uh, users click, something like that is the title. So that conductor study found that number-based headlines perform the best, like 30-some percent, um, versus the worst performer, question-based headlines. So if you tend to do question-based headlines, you might want to rethink that because uh, that percentage was, I think, 12 or 18 percent or something. It's markedly less. So when you decouple the title tag from your title of your, or the name of your blog post, or the name of your page, you have the opportunity to incorporate other keywords and to cut out a lot of the fluff. So this um, screenshot here that you see is from my uh, plugin called SEO Title Tag, which allows you to mass edit title tags across your entire blog, which is pretty cool. You don't have to go individually to every single blog post one at a time and edit it and then save it and then go to the next one and then edit and save it. So this allows you to see a whole bunch of title tags uh, all at one go, and you can even mass edit the post slugs as well. Okay, so next, some essential tools. These are some of our favorites. Uh, Suvel, Answer the Public, and Moz. Um, yeah, so when you are doing keyword research, which is absolutely... I'm going to pull up the tool while you... Okay, cool. So it's imperative that you're doing keyword research and you're not just going with your gut because you have to figure out the data to determine which keywords you should be targeting. So there are keyword brainstorming tools like Suvel and Answer the Public. These are really awesome tools, but they're not going to give you search volume data, which is really what we want to go 
after, after doing our keyword brainstorming. So something like Moz Keyword Explorer is fantastic for doing keyword research and seeing how many searches these keywords are getting in Google per month, and you can choose which country. And so for the most part, you do the United States. And then you can go to discover different keyword opportunities, and you can look at all these other different related keywords, or that include the, what, the words that you put in your query or do, doesn't include. So it's really, really awesome. This is a paid tool, but it's worth it. It is so worth it. Um, so if you have a group of blogger friends, have everyone go in on it, and you can all share it. Right? So you can create keyword lists, and it's, it's awesome. So absolutely use a tool like Moz Keyword Explorer. Don't use the Google AdWords Keyword Planner, though, because that's a highly inaccurate tool. And the reason for that is because they group their keywords by buckets. So sometimes it'll be 30,000, 40,000 searches off. And if the keyword falls somewhere in the middle, it's going to be lumped into one bucket or the other, and it's giving you inaccurate search data. So don't use that tool. And you can also use Ahrefs, which is another great tool. Um, and then what was the other tool? And SEMrush. Uh, yeah, SEMrush as well. Um, why don't and we then actually just next on the list? It was. Yeah. Let's let's actually see what these these tools oh, sure. look like. So this is Suval. Watch what happens as I type some keystrokes. See, it's it's uh, auto completing not just from Google but also Bing. Uh, Yahoo, Answers.com, YouTube, Wikipedia, Amazon, all simultaneously. So as I keep typing, see that? And I can click on any one of these, and it will take me directly to the search results for that keyword that I clicked on in that particular search engine. So that's a great way to get some keyword ideas just when you're brainstorming. But when you get to that kind of hardcore research phase where you want to see the differences in numbers of searches for each of the keywords, that's where Moz Keyword Explorer comes in. So that's what Chloe was explaining. And we could put in, let's say, SEO here, and then choose the US or whatever region we're trying to target. And it will tell us not just the search volume, number of searches estimated per month, so it's a range, but it's 95% accurate because of the way that they do it. So it's really great. And they also give you difficulty scores, which is really cool. So you get to see how hard is it to break into page one for that keyword. And then answer the public. I don't think you mentioned that one yet. Do you want to? Yeah, well, you can pull it up there. Answer the public is another great keyword brainstorming tool. Um, you'll see it up there in a second. There's a weird guy. <laughs> on the home page, it's really strange. It used to be another guy, a weirder another guy. Another weirder guy they is gone. It, they I just replaced it, it with another. <laughs> it's a regular guy. But Anyways, look tool. at this. Free Isn't tool. that beautiful? So do you want to explain how this works? Like, so well, I put in ahead, SEO. I can see the screen, so go ahead and explain it. OK. So I'm going to zoom in a bit. There are what, where, when, why, how types of search queries that are popular and are recommended by Google Suggest. And this tool scrapes all those and then puts them in a nice, pretty uh, wheel there. But you can switch to a data view. And that's going to be a lot easier to look at and see, look, see the uh, different kinds of keywords. Uh, these are searches that are either questions like who, what, why, or when, and why. Or in this case, we're looking at um, implied questions like is or can, well, that is a question, with, to, near, that sort of thing. So we just switch to data view, and there's our how, how SEO works, how SEO is done, how SEO increases sales. And so you might create blog posts about these different topics and thinking, wow, this is stuff that people are searching for on my topic. Let's create an FAQ. Let's create blog posts. Let's build out a learning center based on this stuff. And then we have Majestic. Do you want to mention Majestic? Sure. So when we were talking about off-page SEO and your link profile, so who's linking to you and being such a foundational, huge part of SEO, the way we can look at that is through looking at your site's authority. Okay, this is what Google is looking at when determining where to rank you in their search engine. So if you have a, an authoritative, trusted website, then you're much more likely to be ranked in the search engine. If not, then you're not going to rank at all. Even if you do everything, all this good on-page stuff, I mean, you've done all your keyword research, your blog posts, everything, but then your site has zero authority, you won't rank. 
So it's so critical that you're building authoritative links and upping your site's authority. So if you're, if you're thinking right now, okay, well, what's my site's authority? So you can use third-party tools to take a look at this. Majestic.com is one of the very best ways to look at your site's authority. Now, this is a paid tool as well, but you do get a few free searches a day. Um, again, you can go in on it with some blogger friends. You can all use the tool in more depth, so you can look into your backlinks. Uh, I highly recommend it. Uh, but just for, you know, right now, go ahead, you know, not right now, right now, right? But later after the session, look up your domain on Majestic.com and see what your authority is. Now, this score is from 0 to 100, and it's on a logarithmic scale, like the Richter scale. So even if you see it's 10, it's not 10%, right? It's going to be lower. Um, so it's really, really hard to kind of increase your score once you get to a certain point. So it's, you're not going to ever reach 100, okay? Even like Bed Bath & Beyond is like 60 or something like that. Um, so if you're at, I'd say, a 30, that's a really great score to be at. Obviously, you want to go higher, but um, 30 is a 20 to 30. Is a, is I've a got a 48. Starting score. <laughs> well, you know, it takes a long time. It takes it, I worked hard for many, many years yeah, to get that. But yeah. you, who's uh, Ty Caliente? Okay, that's you. So you can see your trust flow score is, what was it, a nine? Yeah, so that's not great. And your citation flow, that's your importance, also on a log scale, is a, what, 21. So you're more important than you are trusted. You want to be the opposite. You want to be more trusted than you are important, right? Think of somebody, while well, you get more trusted links. Like, for example, I spoke at Stanford for free, paid for it on my own dime to fly out there because I got a link. I wasn't gonna for sure get one, but I did a great job, and they linked to like six different resources that I mentioned in my talk. Stanford.edu, super high trust website, totally worth it. Yeah, right? so link building is all about quality over quantity. It's not about how many sites are linking to you, it's about how high quality those sites are. One really powerful authoritative link is going to trump a thousand low quality links. Yep. So it's all about quality, okay? Our um, so do you want to mention PageSpeed Insights, and I'll pull up the tool while you talk about it? Sure. OK. So when we're talking about your technical SEO, and I talked about PageSpeed, this is how fast your site loads. And you're going to have a different page speed on desktop and mobile. You can look at this through PageSpeed Insights. This is a free tool provided by Google. And you can see how fast your page loads. Now, if you have a really low score, you need to get a developer to help you to increase that, because this is a ranking signal. Google will be looking at how fast or slow your pages load. So it's really, really important that you have a fast loading site, and if you don't, to increase that. Now, increasing it, is, it gets really techy and technical, so get a developer to help you. Um, you know, it, you just, you don't want to really mess with that yourself. But it's really important that you're taking a look at these things and you know that, okay, this needs to be fixed. This is slowing me down. You know, this is, this is negatively impacting uh, my ranking, so I'm going to oversee this and make sure it gets fixed. All right, who's uninvisible pod? Okay, thank you. So we're just pulling up PageSpeed Insights, which is a free tool. If you have enough uh, traffic to your site, then it will actually give you data from the Chrome User Experience Report. Real Chrome users? Using, uh, visiting your site and how fast or slow their experience is, that's pretty awesome if you have enough traffic to get that data. If you don't, then it'll just tell you that there's not enough data for field data, as in, is the case here with um, an invisible pod. But then you see the score is based on lab data, on, on them running some analyses, and it's a five out of 100. So definitely need to work on this. All right, we're out of time, you guys. So if we want to just, Dad, you want to head to the last slide? Yeah. So there is so much that we didn't get to cover today, and there's so much more to this, and I want to help you guys as much as I can. So I encourage you to come up, give me your business card, or head to chloespencer.com, opt in for a free SEO strategy session with me. We'll get on a screen sharing call. I'll pull up your website, and we'll go through some tips and tricks and what's really impacting you, not getting the traffic and the rankings that you want. So I encourage you to go ahead and sign up for that or come up to and talk to me and give me your business card and we'll jump on a call. That is a great offer. 
Very, very generous of you. I wish I had the time to go over uh, your sites with every single one of you. Um, but you recall that you can get a free copy of my book, Google Power Search, by texting 33444 with the keyword blog her SEO, all one word. So please do that. And I'm also going to include for all of you a, uh, access for 30 days to module four of my DIY, do it yourself, SEO auditing course. Module four is technical glitches and easy fixes. So it's a expensive course and you get free access to that module for 30 days. So you should totally take advantage of that. Thank you Thank so much. You.